So hello everyone and welcome to module three. Um, today I'm going to talk about time horizons of control, metrics, and motivation in, in this segment. So I want to start by talking about, by bringing up uh, one of the diagrams from our last meeting. And I draw it as a rocket ship, which you may, you may find odd and maybe not very scientific, but I like these sort of contextual models because they, they help us formulate in our minds how things work and they help us describe them to others. So the reason I chose this ride, went through several iterations of this diagram and this one seems to be the one that resonates most with, with CEOs um, to be able to apply it and take it back to their hut and um, describe why they have all of the metrics that they have and why they're important. And um, yeah, so I gave, I gave you guys this construct and I talked about investments being things that we do obviously to, to have a downstream in, impact on our ability to market, to sell, to deliver, to, to handle all the things that we have to do to handle to our, in our business tactically to make a profit and keep us efficient and optimize our profit. But all, it's also important to take a look at those investments individually to think about how they apply and how they cause trust and loyalty and advocacy to occur um, in the long run. And that's, one, that's another way to look at investments. So if you think about metrics, the goal or the point of a metric is so that you understand the impact of the work that you're doing um, on the business. And it's also to, to create a forcing function or conversations to occur in the wild when you're not in the room. Um, if you have metrics that are important that people are talking about, it will cause behavior change. And that's, that's the point of leadership, right? We wanna influence the behaviors of others and we also want to cause more caring to occur. So if we're only thinking about the tactical implications of the metrics that we're using, we tend to get distortions. We tend to get more of this, less of that, potentially. Um, and we want to make sure that we're balancing and paying attention to both the short term success, the tactical success, the efficiencies of our business and the long term, um, the human relationships. Remember, this is, these are management metrics, these are leadership metrics. And we're talking about measuring human behaviors, which is difficult. It's difficult. And it requires, um, because it is, it is so human oriented, it requires um, a lot of work and a lot of energy, a lot of intellectual capital, you know, putting people in a room and agreeing on how we're going to measure these important words, because as we, as we discussed, these words are very important to us personally. I remember the exercise that we did about around defining trust and how we all had very different definitions. There were a few similarities, but mostly very different and thus um, very subjective and hard to measure. All right. So I want to talk about it in, in the context of, let me share my screen real quick. Um, share the more formal diagram. This is in the slide deck as well that I uploaded into Blackboard. But if you think about it in, the, in this context, you have leading indicators, lagging indicators. These are the most proximal to now, and these are the furthest from now. But what we want to do is we want to understand what's going on in terms of the behaviors, because these will have a leading indicate. These will give us a leading indication of how much profit will be available in the future. And this context um, of time is what I want us to think about um, in the course of of this lecture. So leading indicators, lagging indicators. Um, but easy to measure short term, like more proximal to now, we'll see the results. Whereas these, it takes longer to actually see the results in the form of a return on your investment or a profit or you know, the, the metrics that we're using um, down here. And remember the importance of the importance of these metrics over here in terms of the ability to motivate people um, in the context of self-determination theory. We'll talk about that next. Okay. So coming back to this, I'm going to draw a little bit. We talked about in, in, in the first module, I briefly touched on this concept of self-determination theory as a construct for how we're going to motivate or how people are motivated. Because what, what we do, if you think about it, we're not actually motivating people. You can't really motivate people per se. What you can do, though, is create the environment within which people are most likely to be motivated. 
you can create the environment within which people are most likely to be motivated. And motivated, motivation occurs on this spectrum. Okay, in this spectrum, like if you think about it, you are rarely maximally motivated to do any given thing, rarely. You know, unless you're authentically in a state of flow. For example, I snowboard. So when I'm on my snowboard on a cliff, going down a mountain, dealing with um, obstacles in the moment, I feel as though I'm in a state of flow. Like I have 100% of my personal energy is, is positioned on getting safely down the mountain, enjoying the air. And, you know, I feel like I'm in a state of flow. And I think with, with a lot of sports, it's like that. Or when you're playing a, a really complicated musical piece, you get absorbed. I play a little piano. And when you're playing, you get absorbed by the music and you are fully present in that moment, producing that music um, in the context um, that you're that you're actually in. But most of us, if you think about it in our work lives, it doesn't work that way. Like in our, we, we come to work, this mass coordination of lots of people, and we wanna produce things today and we wanna produce things for tomorrow. So we have this, this scale, this time, these time horizons of control, and these time horizons of, of how we make decisions and think about things. And we have to balance the short term and the long term. And one of the ways that businesses historically have done that is with metrics. Um, and we tend, to, we tend to overvalue the short term metrics and undervalue the long-term metrics. Um, Short-term metrics like marketing and sales and our pipeline and things like that. And we undervalue the, how are we actually building relationships with the people in our human ecosystem to make sure that this business is sustainable um, beyond you know, just our short-term profit. Okay, and we talked about this scale and there's like a high quality motivation and then there's lower, lower quality motivation. Um, and this is a bit of a, a red herring because um, any of the aspects of human needs, because when we talk about motivation, we talk about the different needs. And Maslow figured this out, father of positive psychology, a long, long time ago, decades ago, um, that really we're, we go about the world trying to meet our own needs. And if you think about it, so if, if you're in a group of people, if you're leading a group of people and you have this mission, so let's just, let's just say we have our vision worked out. We know who we're serving, what problems we're solving, how we're going to measure our success. And um, we want people to march towards that maximally. It's rare that they're going to be fully motivated. Like it's rare that they're going to be in a state of flow all the time. Actually, when they show up to work on any given day, if we think about this on it, if we look at this, if we zoom in and look at this um, scale of motivation, people are not they don't show up to work motivated or not motivated. They're always, they're always on a, on the scale, on the spectrum of, of motivation. And, you know, you're going through your day and then all of a sudden, you know, you're doing your work and you start thinking about your vacation that's coming up if you're anything like me. Right. And then you're thinking about your kid's soccer game. Oh, and you're thinking about that class that you have to prepare for Simon um, tonight. Um, all while you're still trying to, get your work done and, and move the business forward, you know? So your, your motivation is being distracted by a bunch of other competing priorities in your, in your, your own mind. And the same things are happening to all of your employees, to all the people that you're leading. They've got a bunch of other priorities and a bunch of other distractions that are limiting their full motivation towards your goal. So what your job as a leader is, is to understand this and to try to figure out what are the things that are going to maximize the motivation in the context of our work together. Like we're, we're assembling as a group of people to accomplish something. So understanding what we're pointing at in terms of um, our intrinsic motivations um, is really important. So, and I, I believe the ultimate, the, the, the most important motivator is understanding what we're pointing at. So this vision concept, like who are we serving? What problems are we solving? How are we going to measure success? And if we bake in real human metrics, what we're doing is we're figuring out um, how to apply essentially self-determination theory, because I believe the highest quality motivator in the context of a group, I'm going to try to prove that to you, to you um, in the actual, in, in the lecture the next time we meet, is this concept of relatedness relatedness. Um, Daniel Pink in his book Drive, when he analyzed self-determination theory in the context of business, he called this purpose. Um, and if you think, if you look back at all of the great philosophers, psychologists who've ever lived, 
um, even, you know, Maslow included with his self-actualization. You know, he described um, towards the end of his career, self-actualization is your ability to um, maximize your potential for the feeling that, that you have this need, this intrinsic need to maximize your potential in the service of others. And Viktor Frankl, um, a man with a, your, you know, Frederick Nietzsche going back to the 1800s, um, but Viktor Frankl quotes him in one of his book, Man's Search for Meaning. You know, he studied people in concentration camps and determined that the people that were successful at surviving the concentration camp, one of the, one of the things they had in common um, largely was that they all believed there was someone on the outside waiting for them. Like they had a purpose that was other oriented and this, this concept of other orientation, same with Edward Becker and his work on the, the Kelsa Sui project, the, the uh, denial of death, like man's purpose is to be relevant, to be relevant in some way to others, you know, beyond their death. So this concept of relatedness purpose, this is like the number one job of the leader establishing the vision. And I believe if you establish the vision clearly enough, meaning we know who we're serving, like we build empathy for the people we're serving, we build, we understand who, we're going to talk a lot about this in the lecture, and we understand and can articulate clearly what problems we're solving for them. And we can see through our metrics how we're going to measure our success. Like we know what success looks like and how we're going to celebrate together when we achieve that. You know, these, this, is, this is the concept of building relatedness. Um, and I believe that that, is, that should be the starting point for figuring out um, for creating an environment where people are maximally inspired. It's like if they're not aligned, if they don't even know where they're going, if you don't have clarity on this stuff, how can you possibly motivate them? And then the next thing down is this concept of um, competence. So once you have that long-term, your eye on this long-term ball, like this is what I'm going to show up at work to achieve, once you have your eye on that long-term ball, then it's a matter of, well, how am I contributing to that? How am I going to, like, what are the skills I'm bringing to the table? Are my skills relevant? And am I growing and learning? This is one of the key things. I've got a lecture, I'm gonna do, we're gonna do a lecture on growth. What am I doing? How am I growing? How am I learning? Um, and how am I contributing to the organization's growth um, is in the context of this. And, and are the people around me, do I have confidence that the people around me um, are capable? So that we are more capable together, like you know, comp this this concept of confidence in myself and my skills and in each other um, is an important concept, and um, it's a real human need. So self determination theory has shown us this is a real serious human need. If you expect to derive intrinsic motivation from people, this is one of the key factors here. This this concept of confidence, and then lastly. You know, autonomy, they talked about autonomy um, in self-determination theory um, and in drive. He uses the same constructs, but it's this is about control in my sense, and I believe it's tightly um, tied to my sense of psychological safety and safety in general, like my, my future, my, my near-term safety and my future safety, which part of that comes from the amount of money that I make. And we need to be aware, you know, that relationship between money and safety. Um, near term and long term for people, you know, there's that that happiness number of seventy thousand dollars a year or something like that. Um, I'm not sure about the science behind that, but it seems reasonable to me to make an a, to make a, an assumption that it's somewhere around there, depending on where you live and how you live your lifestyle. Um, but this concept of like, if I don't feel like I have some sense of control, very little chance of me trying to learn to do something better so that I can achieve this shared goal that we have. Um, so these are, these are kind of the key. This is, these are the, the three aspects of self-determination theory, you know, and when they draw it, when they, when they draw it, they always draw it as a triangle. And I think that's an important thing to think about autonomy, competence, and relatedness, because, you know, you can, you can be undermined by any one of these, by not meeting any one of these. And you can also, be, be largely motivated by only one of these. Like you can have a, you know, tremendous motivation for some higher purpose and give up your sense of control and even give up your, your need to learn. You know, there's plenty of examples of that where, you know, you, you, 
you, you've mastered some skill and you're going to use that skill to achieve that purpose and not continue to grow yourself, potentially. Um, you're just trying to achieve that purpose. And there's also examples of people who are largely motivated by competence alone and be, being the best, absolute best at what they do. Um, obviously, that's being compared to others. There's no way around that. But um, this, is the, this, this can be a large um, component of what motivates you. And we're all different. And we all balance, we all choose what's important to us in, in different contexts and different scenarios differently. Um, and this control one is the same thing. People will do, will go to great lengths to have control over their environment or to feel like they have control over their environment. They'll make really bad decisions for themselves um, just so that they have a sense of control so that they feel like um, they have control over their environment. And I think there's a line that runs somewhere around here and this line is this, you know, these are intrinsic, like higher quality motivators, the intrinsic, on the intrinsic side. And then on the left side of this, you have your extrinsic motivators, which don't go away. They're always there. They're important. These extrinsic, like what is driving, um, in, in Maslow terminology, these are like physiological needs, physiological, physiological. And safety needs, but I think safety kind of draws, like I talked about earlier, crosses this line. In Maslow's terminology, he also had, you know, esteem and belonging and self-actualization in his framework. And there's lots of other motivational frameworks out there. Um, but these are the ones that we, this is, these are the one that, this is what I consider the modern de facto science of human intrinsic motivation because there's so many researchers working on it. It's such a large body of, of supported research, evidence-based research around what causes motivation. You know, Maslow's the, the father of it. So we learn about that in, psych, in our Psych 101 class, at least I did. Um, and there's also this concept of a motivation. There are people that will be, that are not motivated by that thing for whatever reason, could be those sociopaths that we talked about in the first lecture. It could just be that they're not motivated by that thing. Like they have other, their priorities, their offshoots, they're just showing up for a paycheck. And you're not gonna get much creativity out of that, those folks. And you have to be, you have to be aware of that. So again, money plays this interesting role because it rides this line between now and in the near-term future and sometimes in the far off future. Um, and, and by the way, all of these, all of these sort of needs, these these uh, needs, the need for safety, the needs for, need for physiological safety, uh, or uh, to have your physiological needs met, um, or esteem, um, they can all be internalized and become high quality motivators. And the the trick, though, the the complication here is that if if you have people that are solely motivated by money, like they've internalized that this is their goal in life you're going to get distorted behaviors from them. And these are the folks that are going to um, be looking at your business as a way for them to extract profit for themselves to the greatest degree possible. And you'll see, you know, these are the folks that are maximizing their expense accounts and not stewarding the organization's resources. They're taking advantage of, of things. And you want to look out for those behaviors because they're dangerous behaviors. They're cancerous. They're poisonous to the business. And uh, they always lead... They always lead to bad results eventually. All right. Now, what's important with this diagram is this, um, the concept of now and, and before I die, this concept of like, there is a relationship. It's not a perfect relationship, but there is a correlation. This is what Maslow figured out. I think that was beautiful about his work is like, these are needs that I have at this moment. And safety is like in the near term, near term. Knowing your people being connected, learning, growing, you know, learning and growing are, these are further out needs. Like you, you start to think about, hey, how can I get better at this skill? It's much easier to do that once you know these needs are met. Like you have some path to one day retiring and having enough money in the bank so that you don't have to worry so much. Um, these are, these are the, the scale of time is, that you think about when you're, when you're, meeting these needs is longer term. It's longer term and self-actualization, 
you know, the ultimate fulfillment of something of relevance in the world. That's like, before I die, that's like, um, I want to make sure that the body of work that I produce has meaning in the world before I die, you know? So there's a time horizon here. And this is, this is what, this is what I want you to get out of this little segment here. Before I die, I want to be relevant. So there's, there's a time horizon here that I'm going to talk about next. So when you think about time horizons, I like to draw, I have another little chart here. I like to draw that talks about the time, how we organize our, our businesses. So if you're organizing a business, you're, you're creating roles in the business as you grow, you have to keep looking at how am I organized? Like what, are, what is my business? How is my business organization like titles and roles? And these are things that are very, I can't stand them, but they're very important to people. Like it's, a, it's an important motivator for people to be able to prove or show or see that they're growing when their roles change as they, as they grow with the organization, as the organization grows. Um, so these, these titles and these roles are really important. And, and there's two dimensions really that you, that you should be thinking about when you're structuring your organization. There's two dimensions um, when, you're, when you're thinking about the hierarchies of control and order in your organization. The, the, along this line, this is the time horizon. Like the time, like we were just talking about, the time horizon, same with those metrics. People that can think about those long-term metrics, metrics like relationships, the people-oriented metrics, those are the longer term things. Um, and so long term and, um, and short term. And I draw it this way because I think about depth. So th these, these are more, these are somewhat more shallow decisions and these are the deeper, more contemplative um, structured decisions that have more impact on the organization. So if you think about this scale as impact, deep impact, shallow impact, time horizons of control, short-term, long-term. And here's the insight. The insight is that the longer term decisions, the deeper decisions um, that an organization has to make in order to be successful are generally those associated with people and motivation. These are the strategic decisions. The strategic decisions. How am I managing my strategic inputs, my strategic um, outputs? Like these are the people that have to steward and come up with a vision and the culture and the language. You know, vision, culture, language. These are these are the the folks that have to steward that. Um, and the deeper decisions are the same thing. These are generally the deeper. Decisions are generally generally involved. How are you taking care of your human ecosystem? It's the people, um, and the, and the decisions down here are generally those decisions that involve tactical tactical effectiveness. So efficiency and effectiveness, tactical um, efficiency. You know these are these are the things that make sure keep an eye on the profit. Um, you're doing that up here as well. But when you think about time horizons and impact, and this is how we structure our organization. So like people, so if you think about it, the people down here at the core, the people down here at the core, um, these are the people that are on the front lines. So these are your workers in an org. These are your workers. They're making short-term tactical decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're closest to the action, closest to the value creation. You know, and then you've got You've got your line workers or your line managers and every business is structured differently but this is how i want you to think about it like we're, we're choosing these people because they can make decisions on a weekly basis so you know these people are daily these people are more weekly um then you're going to have you know maybe managers who are making decisions on a monthly basis and, and looking at numbers and metrics you know along the monthly um dimension and obviously more deeper impact, deeper decision rights. So they get better, they get more decision rights, a little more control, uh, but it's really about the time horizons that they have control over. And then maybe you have a director level, you know, and you wanna keep your organization obviously as flat as possible because that makes you more efficient in the long run. But this is how we, maybe they're thinking at the quarterly level. Maybe you've got a VP level. VPs are responsible for thinking 
at the annual time horizon, like making those decisions, kind of steering the ship, making making decisions that have a deeper impact, you know, and then you got your CXOs and maybe way out here. And then if, essentially the CEO has should have this infinite mindset, the CEO and the board and advisors should be looking at the long, long term, the long, long term, which is mostly about how are we making sure we're filling our pipeline of strategic talent internally and that our vision is crystal clear so that we're attracting the best um, customers into our ecosystem and we can see changes that are occurring. And that's, that's what we're going to get into in the lecture is visioning and understanding vision. So let me share my screen again. And I'm going to jump to, here we go. I'm going to jump to um, this time horizons of control just to show you. I have that. Oh, I went too far. And I'll give this, to, I'll put this in the slide deck as well. Um, so that you guys have it. Take it with you when you go out into the world. Make the world a better place. So future time horizons, tactical impact of decisions, frontline team leaders, managers, directors, however you organize. This is what it looks like. All right. So organizing your tactics and your strategy, again, keeping in mind that these here are people dimensions. These here are more tactical short-term dimensions. You know, and this is how we this is how we should be thinking about organizing our companies and where we where we put these different decision making um, capabilities in place in our org structures. Cool. All right. I gotta stop the share. Turn it back over to me so you can see my smiling face. And yeah, so that's it. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. It's kind of an introduction to motivation, a little bit deeper understanding. Our job is to take all of these, these people that we're leading and orient them so that they're maximally motiv motivated towards what we're trying to do. And you, you'll never reach, um, you'll never reach maximum motivation. Think about it, you can't even reach maximum motivation for yourself. So how could you expect to extract that from the people that you're leading? Um, it's not reasonable, but it is your job to do the best that you can to, to keep people oriented. And you do that through really good visioning, understanding who we're serving, what problems we're solving, and how we're going to measure our success. Thanks for paying attention, and um, I'll see you on Monday.